Welcome everyone to this special landmark event this evening, a conversation between Benjamin Zephaniah, poet, lyricist, musician and activist, and the writer and editor Malachi McIntosh. Our conversation will be focalized through Benjamin's remarkable autobiography, The Life and Rhymes of Benjamin Zephaniah, which came out in 2018. And we'll be exploring how Benjamin Zephaniah's art and activism have gone hand in hand throughout his career. My name is Elika Burma. I'm the Professor of World Literature in English here at the University of Oxford. And I'm director of the Oxford Centre for Life Writing, which is based at Wolfson College. I'm also investigator on the Writers Make Worlds Open Educational Resources website project, which is hosted in English, and which is one of the parties bringing this event to you tonight. This conversation, which was planned to take place in March 2020, necessarily postponed by COVID, was and is the culminating event in the webinar series, Art and Action, led by Sandra Mayer, based at the University of Vienna, and Ruth Scobie, here in Oxford. It is brought to you in association with several different groups to whom we are all very grateful, and I'd like to give a shout out by mentioning them all. To Torch, our wonderful Humanity Center, and to the Schwarzman Cultural Program, to the Story Museum, where we're meeting tonight, to Art and Action, and to the already mentioned Fell-funded Writers Make Worlds project. The video recording of this event will be available to everyone to watch again afterwards on YouTube, through Writers Make Worlds, and through the Torch website. We're also live streaming tonight. We have a live audience, which is really fantastic. So welcome to everyone out there watching live. In a moment, I'll be handing over to Wes Williams, the director of Torch, to chair the event. But before I do that, I should like to say some introductory words about the two main speakers. Benjamin Zephaniah is one of Britain's most eminent contemporary poets, widely known for his compelling spoken word and recorded performances. An award-winning playwright, novelist, children's author and musician, He's also a committed activist and outspoken campaigner for human and animal rights. He appears regularly on radio and TV and at literary festivals and has also taken part in plays and films. Most famously, perhaps to many, I'm sure, Peaky Blinders. He continues to record and perform with his reggae band, recently releasing the album Revolutionary Minds. His autobiography, The Life and Rhymes of Benjamin Zephaniah, was shortlisted for the Costa Biography Award. In that book, he talks about young people making meaningful music that properly reflects their lives. In the book, he also tells a very meaningful story, reflecting on his own life and speaking in fascinating ways about being a black writer, activist and media figure in Britain today, in the 2020s. We so look forward to hearing more about this in the conversation. Malachi McIntosh is editor and publishing director of The Amazing Wasafiri, a black British and Asian arts and cultural journal. He previously co-led the Runnymede Trust's award-winning Our Migration Story Project and also lectured in post-colonial literature at the University of Cambridge. He's the author of Emigration and Caribbean Literature and editor of Beyond Calypso. His fiction and nonfiction have been published very widely, including in the Caribbean Review of Books and in The Guardian. With the focus in his work on the potency of art and writing to affect positive cultural change, I can't think of a better interlocutor today for Benjamin Zephaniah than Malachi McIntosh. Just before I hand over to them both, just a final word about Art and Action, with whom we're collaborating today. It's a project funded by the Austrian Science Fund, and it explores the intersections between authorship, politics, activism, and celebrity across historical pe periods and across a great variety of media. 
the conference that didn't take place moved into a series of really great webinars that you can access on YouTube and through the TORCH website. And I, I warmly invite you to do that. They are fantastic discussions. This is the culminating discussion. So without further ado, let me hand over. Benjamin, you're very welcome to this platform at the Story Museum. And Wes Williams and Malachi McIntosh, a warm welcome to you too. And over to you. Thank you, Elika. Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us this evening as we come to you live again from the Story Museum here in Oxford. My name, as Elika said, is Professor Wes Williams. I'm the director of Torch, and it's my enormous pleasure and honor to be able to uh, be here and collaborate in this wonderful event this evening. As Elika also said, uh, this event is also part of the Humanities Cultural Programme, part of our Big Tent live event series that's been going on all the way through the pandemic. And this programme is itself one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities. We are, as you can see, socially distancing, uh, safely live streaming this event, um, and we hope that you're all safe and well wherever you are in the world. Before I hand over to our two speakers this evening, I'd like to remind you that you can share any comments and questions uh, for them in the live chat just below uh, the image on YouTube. I'll come back in about three quarters of an hour and mediate the questions uh, back through uh, to the two of them. Um, welcome Malachi, welcome Benjamin. You've both been introduced already uh, by Elika, so there's no need for me to say any more. And without further ado, I'm delighted really to invite you to begin your conversation. I'll be back in about three quarters of an hour. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thank you for having us as well. It is very strange to be talking to you in this format, um, sitting across each other on a bench with a, a non-existent audience, with people at home, obviously. Um, but that said, it's a, it's a huge, huge pleasure, a huge honor to be here with you this evening. Um, the focus of the conversation, as Elika said, is your autobiography, mainly. But it'd be nice to talk around that. And I think, given the circumstances in which we're meeting, the first thing I wanted to ask you is, How's your year been? Well, my year is... I begin to feel really guilty when I talk about my year because I've actually had a really good year. Um, I've been talking to some friends the other day who were, talk, who were talking about mental health during the last year. And it was interesting. Some of them said, you know, they couldn't take isolation and all that stuff. And there were some of us that went, actually, the world was going crazy. I'm glad that it stopped. I just finished doing a tour with my band, a tour with my autobiography. Both of them kind of going simultaneously as well. I had all these other things going on and I was running all over the country. And to stop was actually quite good for me, to actually stop and focus. I wrote a book, Windrush Child, um, and um, I presented a TV series. Um, you know, I, I, I got a wage from my university um, I live in a really nice part of the country, right, where I've got fresh air. A family of deer came to live with me <laughs> in my garden, literally camped out in my garden, a family of deer, so I had company. Um, I have a gym at home. I mean, it, it was cool. But my sister almost died. Okay. My brother-in-law almost died. I've got about six friends that died. Oh. You know, and I've got relatives that live on the 10th floor of council flats in the middle of a city where the lift broke and they couldn't get out. So me, I was okay. But then that's why I say I feel really guilty because I hear lots of stories about other people and how they struggled. Um, but I didn't. And I think that if you are a creative person, if you are doing what you like, um, and you are, especially if you're obviously earning a living from it, and you manage to kind of stay sane through the year, through writing or whatever, and even through other times, you know, when there's no pandemic on, you know, we must remember that we are doing things that we love to do. We are doing things that we probably would do anyway. If I was a painter and decorator, I would still be writing poetry. So I never take what I do for granted. I always remember that there's people 
there was a study done in, in the 80s that said, you know, 80% of people going to work are going on a form of transport they hate, working with people they hate, doing a job they hate. You know, I mean, we are really lucky in the creative world. And um, this is a very long answer to your question, but I remember at my university once um, talking to cleaners and another academic came along and I just arrived and I'm not, I don't have an academic background and I just arrived in academia. And, he kind of, and they were kind of showing me the ropes and he said, you know, you don't have to talk to them, Benjamin. And I was like, <laughs> you know, what's wrong with talking to a cleaner? This is, this is where my family come from, you know, we're cleaners, we're national health service workers, etc. Um, I just never forget the people that clean the streets, that clean the toilets, that do all that stuff, because I could be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a good lockdown, I, it didn't really bother me, um, but I really feel it for those people that it did bother. Yeah, yeah. And what you say about, you know, I don't know, the idea that that, that could very easily have been your path um, mm -hmm. resonates with me too, I think. Um, about, about the year, so, you know, as you said, you, you had space, you had the family of Dia, you had, you know, the work that you, you would be doing anyway. Of course, in the last year, there's been, in the broader national context, if not international context, this huge amount of turmoil, not just around COVID, but I think in England in particular, in the United Kingdom in particular, this political turmoil, yeah. um, which when rereading your autobiography felt reminiscent of the times and when your career sort of launched in, in the 80s, really. I just wonder what your thoughts might have been around all of that as that was unrolling, Boris Johnson, Brexit happening, you know, the culture wars, quote unquote, that are taking place at the moment. Where do I start? Brexit was interesting, is interesting. Because with Brexit, I began to suffer a kind of racism that I experienced in the 80s. I wasn't beaten up by any racists, but I had four or five um, experiences on the street. I, I, I love jogging, where people kind of shouted racist things to me as, as I was jogging. Um, and, and even threatened once. Um, but actually, when it comes to politics generally, when I say politics, I mean when it comes to issues about race and gender and stuff like that, I do think that I kind of came to all this in the 70s, really. And then the 80s was the real years of struggle. And in the 90s, I thought, that's it, you know. We've dealt with sexism, you know, racism. We were all making music together. It was soul to soul. It was all getting together and jamming and, you know, mixed race children and everything else, you know. <laughs> if you would have said to me then, could you imagine an organisation like the EDL? <laughs> or could you, I would have said, absolutely not. Look, look at the direction we're going in. But look where we are. And I think that... Um, one of the problems with um, the state of the world right now is not just that people are sh some people are showing an ugly side, a xenophobic, racist, sexist side. It's that the people who rule them <coughs> are the sexist and racist. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And this is not just me theorising, they've said it. Mm -hmm. When you've got leaders of big countries, leaders of the free world, talk, boasting about how we can grope women, saying this is a perk of the job. And you've got people like that guy in, in um, Brazil, you know, just saying COVID, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's not that bad. And let, let the people suffer. The important thing is chopping down the rainforest and having a party or whatever. I mean, when you've got people at the top I mean, I'm an anarchist, I don't really like any of them, right? <laughs> right. But when you've got them at the top saying that, what do we say to our kids in Tottenham and Hansworth and Oxford? When they, when, you know, we used to say kind of, look at society, you know, this is the way we're going. Now we can't do that anymore. We've got to say, actually, ignore society. <laughs> We've got to do better than that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's weird. Yeah. That's very sad. Um, and it... it when I start my term in university, I, as you know, I didn't really go to school. I didn't go to university, I didn't go to college. I ended up in academia. So I usually say to my students, uh, on paper, you're all more educated than me. 
That's quite a strange thing to say to your students at the start of the term. You are all more educated than me on paper. But I'm your professor. You know, how did I get here? You know, um, with my help, you guys are going to get a good degree or whatever. But you know what? If you have a good degree and you don't have compassion, and you don't have love, and you don't have empathy, it's worth nothing. Yeah. So that's, I think, where it is at the moment, really going back to grassroots and educating people at grassroots. Because really, the, a lot of the, I've got to be careful how I word this, a lot of the educated classes, and a lot of very powerful people in the, edu in the um, educated classes, are not leading by example. Um, we really don't want to follow them. So that's what I think about the state of the world at the moment. It seems like, and almost seems like you're saying things are worse now than they were in the 70s and 80s. I remember once I was talking on radio about fighting the National Front in the East End of London. And this is before all the internet and all that. And uh, I got home and a couple of weeks later, somebody wrote me a letter. And he said, you know, I used to fight you. <laughs> I was a, a National Front skinhead fog, but I'm now a Buddhist monk. <laughs> <laughs> right, he turned into a Buddhist monk, and you could literally see the tears on the page, you know. Um, and um, I think he um, he realised that his violence. Well, he said in the letter that his violence was wrong, and um, that people are just people, and that he was a thug. Mm. Well, now you have intellectuals that are racist. <laughs> I mean, saying like they shouldn't go together, <laughs> but you know, you have academic racist academics. I've been doing television programs where I'm going on to talk about my experience, and they say for balance, we're going to have a racist. <laughs> <laughs> <Are we? laughs> so, in one sense, things have got worse. I could meet that guy on the street and I could fight him. And I could say, you're wrong, leave me alone, because I'm black, shouldn't be hitting me and anything. And he can go away and, I don't know, smoke a spliff or whatever and get a conversion and turn <laughs> into a monk, right? But when you've got people that say that they have a canon of literature that backs them up, and they've got science that backs them up and everything, and they teach in the academy. <laughs> I mean, it is worse. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I was going to make an analogy, and I've got to be very careful how I say this, but it's a bit like some women saying that, you know, I've been beaten by a partner, but the mental abuse was worse. Of course, the physical stuff hurts, but the mental abuse is, 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 can be worse. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it could be worse. Yeah. Weren't there, I mean, weren't there always racist academics? So are you saying they've been empowered in a way that they weren't before? They were, I guess, but they were really in the margins. Mm -hmm. They were really in the margins. Uh, now they're on prime time television. Now they have parties. You know, I remember, I'm going to be very careful not to call names, but I remember um, doing a TV programme with a well-known xenophobe. And um, very respectable, you know, he's got a, a, a legal political party. But then I saw his security behind him. And I looked at them and I kind of thought, I recognise these guys. And again, it was the guys that I was fighting in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. They put on suits now and they got jobs of security. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, so it's, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer about have we, has things got better or worse. Yeah. Things have changed. Things have changed. I wrote a poem called This Policeman Keeps on Kicking Me to Death in 1978, after the murder of George Floyd and a light being shone on the deaths in custody of people in Britain, that poem became popular. I hate to use that word, but you know, people started Came going back. back to it and yeah. started reading it again and listening to it. It's a sign of the times. Yeah. You know, we can go back to old stuff about our struggle and it's still relevant. Mm. There's, a, there's a documentary about, yeah, I think the first called Pen Rhythm Poet, which is now on YouTube for everybody who's watching this on I YouTube. hate it. <laughs> I, know that, I know the one on the street is that you hate it. Um, I can talk about why, but there's, there are some really amazing scenes in it, and one of them is you reading, I think it might be that same poem. Yes. 
in Trafalgar Square, yes. in front of NF people yes. who were doing the Nazi salute. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that's really interesting because it fills me doing this poem. Actually, it was Fight Them, Not Me. Yes, I love that poem, by the way. And in that poem, all I'm saying to racists is that when I hear some of these racists talking about why they're angry, I agree with them, right? But I'm, what I'm saying to them, it's not my fault. So if you're getting uptight and you want to fight, fight them, not me. If you check out the scene and things ain't right, see them, not me. I came, I saw, I live here and I have my tribulation to be here. If you're getting uptight and you really want fight, fight them, not me. If you live in a kitchen and you can't afford chicken, blame them, not me. I'm, I'm pleading with them, I'm saying, yeah, I agree with you. Yep. So let me and you get together and deal with the people who are oppressing all of us. That's all I'm saying in that poem. So anyway, I'm doing it in Trafalgar Square and the cameraman is filming and I come to the end of the poem. And I think he wanted a clapperboard or something. He didn't get one, so he kind of went like that. Because mm -hmm. you see the camera goes like that. Yeah. And then it just catches two people, Sieg Heilin. Broad daylight, Trafalgar Square, skinhead fogs. Um, and that's what it was like then. <laughs> In the middle of the day, walking around Trafalgar Square, doing Nazi salutes, and nobody did a thing. And they came to my gig. And they came to your gig, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe one of them is the one that wrote to you. <laughs> Who knows? That's possible. <laughs> um, that's a good way of kind of moving into this a bit readily. Something I did want to talk about, which is your autobiography gives us a very detailed picture of that point in time. So the 70s, 80s, when you know, you're coming mm. up, when your career started, which we don't really get often. Right, so there's more and more focus, it was just this week, on the Windrush generation, so your parents, my grandparents. Um, there's lots of focus, I think, in good ways and bad ways, on the contemporary generation of, of young Londoners in particular, um, artists and musicians, you know, especially. But that moment in time, particularly the experience of black Britons outside of London, as you were in Birmingham, I feel like the spotlight doesn't get shone on that very yeah. much. Well, when I was doing my autobiography, well, you see how it starts. I really didn't want to do one, you know. Um, but I thought if I was going to do one, it had to be not just about me, which is quite ironic because I did see a review once. I don't really read reviews that much, but a woman was complaining. She said, I just read Benjamin Zephaniah's autobiography and he keeps talking about himself. Why did he go on about himself? <laughs> 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 and I really try not to make it about me as, as much as possible. I it's had a kind to of fundamental there. misunderstanding of the genre. <laughs> yeah. as the person. Um, but I did want it to be kind of a documentation of what was going on politically and culturally. And I don't claim to be an expert, but it's, a, but it's from what I saw and, and what affected me and how it affected my writing. And it's really interesting because when we had to... Um, if we came across any, any writing like that, it was always American. You know, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, and stuff like that. That's what we were reading. Um, and it's interesting, after my autobiography was published, I got letters from America saying, at last, yeah. you know, they weren't comparing me to Malcolm X, but they were saying black British experience is being documented. Um, and I think it was great. Around that time, around the same time, Akala's book came out, and. Kahindi Andrew's book came out and a few other things came out which I thought was just really good. We are now creating a canon of work that represents us and we're not just kind of reading American stuff and thinking that we have nothing to offer. Um, but yes, it, it's... Um, I find myself kind of just talking to young cats now and I'm just talking and I think I'm just having a conversation about some music I was listening to and then at the end of the conversation they go wow that was amazing history <laughs> <laughs> it was just like you just a moment ago I kind of I was going to laugh and you said um, you talk about the Windrush generation you went your parents my grandparents <laughs> yeah I'm old <laughs> you know what I mean I remember there was a time when like you know Ladies used to come up to me and they used to go, yeah, I, I, I like your work. And I used to go, yeah, yeah, cool, you know, fine. You know. Now they come up and they go, oh, my parents used to read your poetry to me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am old. <laughs> but it's important that we kind of write our, document our history and we do it truthfully. And one of my obsessions has been in 
writing my autobiography or in inter interviews, as I said to you before we started, you know, there's no no-go areas. I believe in absolute honesty. I like being not like, but I think it's important to be honest about your mistakes because um, that's how we learn. There's a line in one of my poems that says, I passed through university, I passed through sociology, and then I got a dread degree in dreadful ghettoology. You know, I learn by meeting people, by making mistakes. I learn from the streets. Um, and I think that's important, especially, I don't want it to boil down to a conversation about men and race, but it's true, especially for black men, I think, when I grew up, there's no other way to put this. I grew up really sexist. My, all the men around me were really sexist. And I remember my sisters had a doll once, or they had many dolls, and I started combing their hair. And my dad got me and he put me in a room and he said, stop that now. <laughs> I mean, I, don't, I didn't realize at the time he was worried that I go gay or something. But he was like, you stop that now, and here's a gun, you play with that. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's a light-hearted kind of example of the attitude to women. But there's lots of other things I could tell you about which were really horrible. You may know that my mother was really beaten by my father. Um, so I grew up really sexist and with really strange attitudes to lots of things, but I learned that from other people. Then I started to think for myself, and, um, and that's when the change happened. So I think it's important, if you want to understand me, to understand how I got here and the journey and the mistakes I made. And that's why I'm so open. People in my family and lots of people say, stop talking about these things, stop talking about them. Even ex-girlfriends say, why do you keep talking about these things? <laughs> I can't help it. Mm -hmm. You know, people really want to know who I am. I can stand here and... I could attempt to stand here and lie, or sit here and lie, and say that, you know, well, what happened was I started to love literature, and I grew up with literature, and I grew up in a house of books. I didn't. Mm -hmm. When my dad caught me with a book reading one day, and he slapped it out of my hand, I said, what, you boy, you got nothing to do? <laughs> and he found something for me to do. <laughs> he thought, you know, you read when you got nothing to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, it, 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 it's important that we are really honest about ourselves, about our journey, and as black men, about our relationship with our mothers and with our partners, um, because we have to grow as a people. Yeah. And as individuals, too. And as individuals, yes. Yeah. On, on that, there was a particular part of the autobiography um, that I copied out that I wanted to talk about, um, which is almost the scene of conversion effectively so the bit where you are at home you've got a gun under your pillow yeah um you're looking up at the ceiling i might just i might just read it out <laughs> you you say it better than i do so one summer night in 1978 i lay on my bed looking up at the ceiling wondering what life was all about the ceiling seemed to represent the limits of my ambitions but these ambitions were related to the circumstances i found myself in some of the bad choices i made and some of the bad people i followed it was time to really think for myself I recalled my teacher at Broadway Comprehensive telling me I was a born failure and that I would soon be dead or doing a life sentence in prison. I didn't have to be a mastermind to see that things carried on. That's where they would go, effectively. I wanted to be a poet when I grew up, and there I was looking at the ceiling that belonged to Birmingham Council with a gun under my pillow, thinking I was some kind of triad gang master don or ghetto godfather. Mm. Just as the eight-year-old me had done, I spoke the words out loud. I want to be a poet. I want to prove that teacher wrong. And then... That's what you do, which is kind of fascinating. So there are a couple of things that one is, you know, you're talking about effectively like hyper masculinity and, and the culture and, you know, referring to the gang master or ghetto, or ghetto godfather right. <laughs> really sort of slots into that. But, but bigger than that and, and, you know, thinking about change, it seems like such a cinematic moment, you know, you're in bed, you're looking at this and the guns are pillar, they're coming to get you and you decide you want to be a poet. Is that how it went down. It's absolutely true. I mean, it's, it's edited, there's more to it, <laughs> but it's absolutely true. I did have a gun under my pillow. Somebody wanted to kill me because um, one of my guys had shot somebody else. Um, we had a little crime syndicate going on and it was just stealing tools from cars, which sounds so trivial now, but, <laughs> but back then it was a, a bit of a deal, you know, and we crossed over into somebody's territory. 
um, a teacher had said to me when I got expelled from school, I'm going to end up dead or doing a life sentence. And I got to the point where I thought, oh, she, maybe she's right, you know, and then I said, I can prove her wrong. <laughs> that whole piece there is why when I'm in school talking to small children and they say, can you tell us the most important thing you ever did? And I said it before, actually, which was think for myself. Learn to think for myself. Um, when I was being the ghetto godfather, the Rastafarian Peaky Blinder, <laughs> I, I wasn't really thinking for myself, you know. You had to get status by being big, by being bad, by putting people down, and I could do it really well. But I wasn't really being true to myself. You know? I can remember doing a burglary, and again, I t I say this with a smile on my face, and I, I'm, I'm, when I'm performing, especially when I'm performing around Birmingham, I go on stage, and one of the first things I do is apologise to the audience, just in case I, I robbed one of the houses. <laughs> 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 and sometimes they put their hand up and go, yeah, you know. Um, but I remember kind of doing a burglary in Birmingham, and going in the house, and just looking at the bookshelves, and thinking, these people read. And memorising the smell of the house, and having, a, a, in my mind, kind of, in a literary way, describing the feel of the carpet underneath my feet and everything. And then we got out, and then one of the guys who was like the watch guy said, what was it like? And I started to explain, as if I was writing a novel, <laughs> I said there was a great wall of literature. And he went, where's the fucking money? <laughs> <laughs> stop, stop talking like that. Really, you know? There was a part of me that always wanted to be a writer. I would always, there's so many things in my novel, which are little snippets from real life when I was young, and I remember them. And I kind of thought to myself, I'm going to use that one day. But when I got a teacher, somebody who's educated, telling me that I'm going to end up dead or doing a life sentence, I thought, well, she knows more about the world than me, so maybe she's right. And in that one night, I said to myself, I am going to end up dead or doing a life sentence if I stay here. So I got in a car and I just drove to London. The car wasn't even roadworthy. I drove to London. And when I tell this story to school children, I tell them that I was involved in gangs. And, you know, and I was doing all these bad things. And then I went to London. And guess what, boys and girls? I got involved in another gang. And the kids go, oh. And I go, yeah, but it was a gang of poets <laughs> and musicians <laughs> and writers. You know, and you can see all the kids start smiling. Because you know? that's what it is. Yeah. We all need gangs. I said to an academic the other day that we are um, pack animals. And he corrected me. He said, no, 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 we are social animals. I understand. There's a slight difference. I understand the difference. But... We all like gangs, and so if you're a writer, you tend to know people who are writers. If you're a thief, you tend to know people who are thieves. You know, politicians are gangs. You have politicians on opposing sides who go on holiday together. <laughs> you know, um, trust me, I've seen that. Um, so what it is is about finding company, and I was really lucky. I came to London, and the alternative cabaret movement started with Rick Mail, Alexis Sale, Dawn French, and those people, and. They were like, after years and years of racist and sexist comedy and, and, and poetry, um, we said, we're going to do something different. We didn't attack anybody, uh, unless they were politicians, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but we would never laugh at somebody because of their ethnicity. I never said it, because of their race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, we'd never mock women or anything like that. Um, but Thatcher was OK. We could do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, yeah, it, it's about finding the right gang. And, and thinking for yourself, is, to me, it's the most important thing that people can do. Be really honest. Trust me, just ask people what they think about a certain issue. And then dig down, because usually they'll start to answer as a British person or as a black man or something. And I'm like, what do you really think? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes time to really dig down. And you can find a completely different answer to the one they started with. Because we all have this front and we all have this thing, that, which is all fakery, actually, nationality. Even race is a construct. Um, but when it comes to nationality and the flag you fly and all that stuff, it's all constructed stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. When you ask people what they really think, sometimes you can take time to dig down, but you can be surprised by the answers sometimes. 
I guess to an extent, you know, you talked about your dad taking the, the doll away from you. A lot of what we see the world through are those ideas that are projected onto us, right? Yeah. So in that case, masculinity or, or you know, nationality or whatever, whatever else it is. So what do you think it takes to, you, you encourage people to think for themselves? What's the first step in that process? What's the first step? Um, it's usually reading a good book. <laughs> um, um, it's just realizing that you're important, but you're not the center of the universe. And understanding that you're not, when we say black lives matter, um, we don't say all white people are racist. We say, you know, white people can kind of take on racist tendencies and not realize they're doing it and in the workplace, in academia, in, in the music business, whatever. It doesn't mean that they're horrible people. It just means look at yourself and try to relearn some of your habits, whatever it is. That's what I realised when I realised that I was sexist. I said, right, I've got to be very conscious of some of, the, some of my attitudes and I've got to change my ways. And, and, and the great thing was, I just said, it's going to make me a better person, you know. That may be selfish. I mean, I know it's going to help with the liberation of women, but it's going to make <laughs> me a better person too, you know. And, and, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So... Finding the good book and also, I guess, thinking about the value that that change might bring to the world and yourself yeah, at the yeah, same time. Yeah. yeah. We're supposed to be talking about you oh, sorry. as a public intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, not your fault, my fault. <laughs> but I, I prefer to talk about Birmingham. Um, do you feel like a celebrity? No, I don't feel anybody celebrating me. But I do realize, I mean, at one point in the mid 90s, somebody said, that I was the most photographed and filmed poet in the world. But I, I think, I'm, I'm not sure when the internet started, but I think it was before the internet. And I can understand why they said that, because you know, if you'd have said the poet laureate, most people wouldn't know what he looked like. You knew names, but you didn't know people. I mean, I was probably the first poet that was on prime time television, that was on top of the pops, you know. <laughs> um, and that was also involved in political debates and stuff like that. So people would know me for different reasons. Um, but I don't feel like a celebrity. I tend to shy away of, from doing things on media that have the word celebrity tagged onto them. Mm -hmm. I have done some, and I'll be doing some in the future. But on every one of them, you can see there's a charitable cause. So I did Mastermind, which I made a complete fool of myself. Um, <laughs> but I've done, you know, Celebrity Antique Roadshow and stuff like that. But that is just for the laugh and just for the raising money for, the, for charities. Um, they tried to get me to go into Big Brother. They offered me a lot of money. I won't tell you how much they offered me. I wouldn't do it. They tried to get me to go in the jungle. I wouldn't do it. And, you know, I, I just can't do that. But I think it's important if you are a writer that says something about the conditions we live in and the way that we can be oppressed by certain systems, etc., etc., then you should be able to show your face and get involved in public debates. I would never call myself a public intellectual. I'm not sure if I call myself an intellectual. If an intellectual means a curious mind and trying to build a point of view on all these things, yes, maybe. Um, but when I hear real intellectuals, I mean, I, I'm close to worshipping Noam Chomsky and um, people like that. I, Christopher Hitchens, I re he was a friend of mine who I disagree with sometimes, but I just loved the way he would dig down and analyse things. And, you know, and even when I disagreed with him, I could see the logic of where oh, yeah. he was coming from. Mm -hmm. um, w when I think of myself against people like that, I think, no way. But one of the things that I have that a lot of those cats don't have is like real experience, you know. They may have ideas about policing in, in Britain or whatever, of lost teeth and lost locks because of policing in Britain, mm. you know. They may have theories about domestic violence and stuff like that. Well, I've seen my mother almost killed. I had to stab my father to save her life, you know. So that's what I have, mm. which a lot of those guys don't have. And it's missing, I think, from a lot of 
public debates in Britain? Yeah, you can. You know, when I teach poetry um, at Brunel, one of the things I tell the students is that to use your experience. So what happens usually, the girls start writing about, it's usually boyfriend poems, <laughs> it starts <laughs> off, and I say, come on, no, dig deeper, and then, and then you know, after a few weeks, they get it. Um, and I say to people, if you've had experiences, especially if they've been negative, here you can turn it into a positive. You're not studying Shakespeare or Shelley. This is you. Mm -hmm. Study your life, you know. And the ones who find it difficult are the people that kind of are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They've had no experience. And I remember talking to a student about this, and he just, he went, yeah, that's me. Mm -hmm. He said, every time I got a problem, daddy sends a helicopter and rescues me, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I said, well, that's no reason why you can't find solidarity with people. Don't fake it but you can still have solidarity with people who are suffering. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's kind of, I think there's an importance in all our experiences, even if they are privileged, to be honest about them. Just before we turn on to questions, one last question. Firstly, you've just won a BAFTA, congratulations. Mm. <laughs> um, for a uh, show that was bringing attention to up and coming talents, poets, um, I don't want to make you feel old again, but there's a generation of folks who are coming up somewhat in your mold. I'm thinking of a colleague you mentioned before, Loki, um, sort of folks who straddle that divide between politics, music, art, etc. cetera. Um, just curious how you feel about that movement. Um, is it, do you feel inspired by those folks coming up? Do you feel that you had a role to play in that, in that space? Do you feel, I don't know, just generally? I mean, oh, I know. I mean, when I did Life and Rhymes, almost every poet <laughs> would come to me and say, you know, I studied your poems, I read your poems when I was a kid, you know, and you inspired me to do it. And it's, a, it's, it's great, and it's great to do that programme, because I feel like the grandfather, uh, the grandfather, if you like, of, of, the, of this form of what we used to call dub poetry, but now is generally performance poetry. Um, and I think it's brilliant. Once upon a time, I don't know how old you are, but you may, it might be difficult for you to get this. Once upon a time, it was like black and white, right? It literally was that. There was like white and there was black. And Asians were seen as black, right? It was a political term, right? And they were gay and straight, right? Now, you've got, you know, bisexual, you've got trans, you got, then you've got Jamaicans and then you got Nigerians and you know and within the Asian community you got the Hindus and the Sikhs and everybody's got a separate identity it's amazing how it kind of pulls apart mm -hmm. in one sense it was a lot easier back in the day but I kind of enjoy listening to the complexity of it all and how they're kind of doing their negotiations and sometimes it gets angry sometimes it gets tense I've seen it with my own students um, it's a bit like thinking I used to think that all the LGBTQ plus people would be on the same boat. I, I, was, I was amazed one day in my class a massive argument broke out because somebody said they were gender fluid or somebody and a gay person said, you know, stop sitting on the fence. <laughs> and then this, is, this whole argument, you know, and all the straight people were going, oh my gosh, what's happening over there? <laughs> but it's interesting. And for us, it was, I don't want to say simpler, but there was just something a lot more, sorry for repeating it, black and white about it. Mm -hmm. Now it's a lot more complex. And I think this new generation deserves that. Because I knew people when I was growing up who were gay, who you know, wanted to be trans, but they couldn't do it because of the, the way our communities were. When I listen to young poets now speaking about all kinds of things, it kind of, it really does fascinate me. One of the things I do find really difficult is when, um, and I'm going to get a bit controversial now, but when people like Jermaine Greer, who I've known for years, who kind of turned on a generation before me to feminism, and then became a dear friend of mine, and I kind of see how passionate she is about issues. When I see her being kind of not platformed, you know, mm -hmm. um, I do find that difficult and now I realize when you're doing interviews and things you've got to be careful about every word you say um, that's a completely different thing but generally speaking these new 
activist poets, I love them. Linton Quayda Johnson said the other day in an interview, he said that um, he's kind of slightly going into retirement and he doesn't really feel inspired or the need to write new poetry anymore. I do. I, f I, I feel completely inspired. But when the murder of George Floyd happened, I kind of sat back and thought, I'm not going to get involved in this. Was, this is a new generation of activists coming forward. But that new generation of activists, they called upon me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was happy to step up. But I am inspired. And, and the other thing that really inspires me, sorry, these are very long answers to no, your question. No, no, no. But the other thing that really does inspire me is the fact that even five, well, four years ago when I was on the Black Lives Matter march, it was mainly black people, you know. Now there's white people, there's all kinds of people on the marches. And gay pride marches with always gay people. Now there's all kinds of people on them. Mm -hmm. I just love this kind of intersexuality that's mm -hmm. going in, intersexuality mm -hmm. um, that's going on. This this people connect people connecting things. I find that really really fascinating and inspiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this black and whiteness. I guess you know you spoke about it was it was simpler, but maybe it was making something complex. Less complex, if that makes sense. I think what it was, was it was we really didn't have the luxury of saying, well, I'm Jamaican and I'm Bajan and I'm Trinidad. Because mm -hmm. we were all, as far as the races were concerned, we were all, I'm tempted to use the N-word, I'm not going to, but, you know, we were all the N-word and we were all the P-word, you know. And they, they wouldn't beat you a little less because you were a bit lighter skinned than me, <laughs> you know. Um, and if somebody was gay and being beaten because they were gay, there wasn't somebody analysing them saying, do we beat them harder because they're gay or is this person trans? Or, mm -hmm. No, they hated us all equally. <laughs> so we were much more united and we weren't kind of breaking up to, into little groups. Mm -hmm. I think people have more space to do that now. But I still say that when you look at our main oppressor worldwide, they are the same people, you know. As they were, yeah. And they know how to divide and rule us. So it's okay me saying I come from Jamaican background and I'm from Birmingham and I support Aston Villa. And you may be saying, I, I don't know where you come from, but <laughs> somebody may be saying I'm Nigerian or Indian and I support Tottenham or whatever. When it comes to fighting the racist, we must be united. Thanks, that's a perfect transition point. Um, should we open up to... I'm going to walk back in again now. Um, so I've been collecting the questions that have been coming in. Um, and actually, the first one I'd like to bring into it is from Elika. Um, and it carries on directly from what you've just been talking about. Um, and it's a question to both of you, which is, do you have any insights about how any people who want to fight the racists um, can be better activists in the UK now then perhaps, you know, I was very, very moved when you were talking about, you know, the 70s and 80s. I grew up through that too. Um, is there, a, have you got insights on how to be better activists now? A few years ago, I would, be, I would talk about taking to the streets and stuff like that, but this, this, they're trying their best to stop that. Mm. Um, so there's a whole area of, um, and I find it, so much with young people now of activism online and stuff, which I'm, I am just, I'm just not clued into. Um, I'm still old fashioned in that. I mean, I do a bit on Twitter, but I don't really have the political debates there and I don't, mm. you know, I don't engage with it much. But um, so my old fashioned way of going to the streets may kind of end up being illegal quite soon mm. because it's becoming more and more illegal. Mm. Um, Sorry for hesitating like this, but I've got to say, I'm a, rev I'm a revolutionary. Mm. And I think that's the, I think all we are doing is, I don't know who it was, some, it may have been Karl Marx, somebody said that capitalism will eat itself, you know, we'll bite mm -hmm. away at it. Mm -hmm. But that's no reason for us to sit back and, you know. yeah. I believe we've got to stand up and we, we um, and the future that I want to see I actually don't know what it is yet. I, I, in other words, I'm not going to dictate. I'm not going to say, anything, well, I've got this point of view. I think the old ideas of Marxism and all this kind of stuff. You talk to young people about that now, and they go, that's old. 
Mm. The idea that workers are going to be in the factory and they're going to put the tools down, mm. <laughs> you mm. know, and mark... No, people mm. are behind laptops now. Mm. And this is one of the problems. This is the problems that all us anarchists have with people who are not anarchists. They say, well, what's this world that you imagine? Well, we need to have a conversation about it. We need to do it together. It's not about me imagining it and then mm. putting it on you. Mm. That's the point of it. Mm. Mm. And if you look at all the leading anarchist intellectuals in the world, people that, like Noam Chomsky, Arudati Roy, mm. what have they got in common? They don't want to be leaders, <laughs> you know? Mm. 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 So I'm a revolution, and like Bob Marley said, it takes a revolution to make a solution. Mm. There's too much confusion and there's just so much frustration. Mm. So? So Malachi, I'm going to ask you the same question. I'm going to set you up partly because of the way your conversation went earlier as the younger generation for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Come, I'm, young man. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not, I'm not as young as I wish I was. Um, and I am, as everyone who knows me, very tech phobic. So I think the best way to talk about how things can be done now is along the lines of what you're saying at the end. I think we need to get different groups of folks together to talk through it. I think it's, you know, I think younger folks who are organizing now very much need to learn the history and go back and see what was effective in the past. Um, and at times it seems like that might not be happening, but that's because I'm old. And of course I'm older, therefore I think young people aren't doing various different things. Um, but I think there is space for, for getting together and kind of coordinating and collaborating. Any kind of advocacy activism work that I've done, I've never ever had an idea what to do. I have just been in situations I'm sure you have where you feel something has to be done, right? Mm. Mm. Um, and you try to get the right people at the table to talk about what, what can we do, what can we do with this? Um, so, yeah, I think everything begins with, with conversation and, and, and planning collectively. And along the lines also what you said earlier, Benjamin, you know, I feel that the folks who are running things, that's exactly what they don't want us that's to do. That's what they fear. Yeah. 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 They actually fear it. Yeah. And that's why they're so desperate. That's why they want to stop us coming out on the streets. Yeah. Yeah. That's why even when a woman is uh, killed, um, uh, um, I forget her name, Everard, yeah. um, um, you know, there, 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 there's um, forces that don't want women to get, to get together because they realise that you know, this could lead on to one thing, could lead on to another thing, could lead on to another thing. They are... I can say paranoid, but they are scared. Petrified, yeah. yeah. And I feel like the, the new rhetoric around the white working class is very much in this, in this line, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in England, the powers that be have absolutely nothing to say to the white working class, mm. have absolutely mm. nothing in common with them. And in my opinion, they don't care about them at all. Yeah. Um, but the only way to shore up their power is to do what they can to try to disconnect those individuals from the very people who live in their neighborhoods, who know their lives. You said it all in the poem that you actually, you know, I mean, my hairs on my neck were going up when you, when you started reciting from the poem, Fight Them, Not Me. I mean, that's, that's what that poem is about. And I wondered if, if, one, if we could think, again, this is a question from Malika, but it's, it's one I have as well, which is, um, what about noise? What about sound? What about rhythm? Um, can we just think collectively about politics of that? Because you've, in your discussion, you ranged over a whole range of, of different questions, but when, one of the key things that you have, as well as your experience, is a particular relationship to noise, to sound, to rhythm. And I'm thinking, obviously, part of that is, is, is scriptural, it's biblical, it comes from a long, long well of, of, of all sorts of different places. You know, what knocked down the walls of Jericho? Well, it was partly sound. Mm. I wonder if sound can do stuff, if rhythm can do stuff, as well as, if you like, as well as the content. Am I making sense here to you? Yes, but I've been using music and poetry and sound, vibrations, whatever you want to call it, all my creative life. And I have absolutely no doubt about the power of it. I, uh, I mean, on a small level and on a bigger level. I remember being in a pub in Dublin and talking about the importance of um, creativity in education. Thatcher at the time was trying to get rid of focus on the reading, writing and arithmetic, not, the, not kind of literature and arts and plays and stuff like that. So I did a gig and I did this talk about it afterwards. Many, many years later, Nelson Mandela comes out of prison. I'm in South Africa. This guy comes up to me and he says, um, I remember that talk you did in Dublin about the importance of arts and creativity in education. 
And he says, I've taken that with me to my new job. And I said, what's your job? He said, I'm the Minister of Education. <laughs> you know, that's just me <laughs> yeah. talking in a pub in yeah. Dublin. Yeah. And I didn't know I was talking to the future Minister of Education for South Africa. But um, I'm sure you don't remember the Nicaraguan revolution. This is a revolution in Nicaragua, uh, mm. Sandinistas, mm. where at the end of the revolution, they won power. And um, they saw that most of their leaders were dead. But the people who were alive that really inspired the revolution were the writers and the poets and the musicians. Mm -hmm. And they all ended up in government. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine, um, Carlos Rigsby, ended up being the mayor of Bluefield. You know. um, this is a government of poets. I mean, it's changed and something went wrong. But, um, but the reason why they were able to do that was because um, the poets and musicians with their sounds and vibrations and their music and everything inspired the people mm. and within the Palestinian struggle I mean, he's not alive any, any, anymore but um, Mahmoud Dawish mm. was a great poet and at one point he, was, he said I'm going to join the PLO wherever. and everybody went no 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 there's enough people joining the PLO <laughs> we need you to write to inspire us yeah. Yeah. So I, I know the importance of, um, of, of, um, of literature and music and poetry in Jamaica no politician would go to election without having a particular poet or musician on their side mm. that's why they shot Bob Marley because he refused mm. to take sides mm. Mm. Malachi do you want to say anything about this <sighs> nothing major except let's interview Malachi now. yeah no, I, I don't know it's strange well, to be asked the questions ask about question, which is <laughs> well which <laughs> if I mean if as uh, Benjamin says kind of poets can be inspirational who apart from Benjamin, inspires you at the moment? Who are the poets? And I'll come back to you, Benjamin, in a minute, if I may. Who, who are you reading now as inspiration? Um, because you talked earlier about a book being an important thing in a person's life. What are the books? One or two books. Oh, gosh. Um, if I could just say some really quick on sound, which, again, just builds Sorry. on what yeah. you said. Um, so all you have to do is look at a football match yeah. and the way a chant can turn a disparate group of people into a unified force, right? For good and for ill. Um, that's the power of sound. It's, it's you know, it's as simple as simple as that. And on things that I'm reading, Roger Robinson, I think, is a spectacular right. poet yeah. um, and a spectacular performer. I mean, you know, mm. if you don't know him, people at home look him up. Um, Dion Brand, a Trinidadian writer who I adore from Canada. Um, hey, Bernard. Jay Bernard, mm. of course. Yeah. I mean, there's so many. I mean, as you're saying about you know people coming up in the excitement. So many voices now, yes. I think, um, who are doing just really, really incredible things. Um, Caleb Femi, Rachel Long, um, this whole new generation of, of poets um, from all over the place who are, yeah, I don't know, just, just naming things, giving things the right name. I think that's what poets do. They, they, mm -hmm. they describe it in a way where you say, ah, mm -hmm. um, and there's so many folks doing that now. Mm -hmm. And going back to the as you rightly said, cinematic moment when the gun under your pillow and you and you come to London and you find your way into this gang of poets. Um, were there particular books or poets or voices at that moment that you had the aha moment that Malachi has just talked about with? Well, like I said, I didn't really grow up in a house with books. No. Um, so, um, for me... <laughs> There was a kind of book, but it was called an LP. <laughs> right? yeah. So we listened to music. I mean, Bob Marley is an obvious one, but actually Bob Marley is like the commercial side. There's other singers, uh, Pablo Moses, Burning Spear. Burning Spear sang about education all the time, the importance yeah. of education. Um, Peter Tosh, who I became a very good friend with, who was one of the original whalers. A Macintosh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bob Marley, of oh, course, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, Bob Marley. I'm um, Bonnie Whaler, mm -hmm. um, Judy Mohart, um, who was known as being one of Bob Marley's backing singers, but she was a singer in her own right as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it, for me, it was really the music. When I started to really read, the book that I read was The Philosophies and Opinions of Marcus Garvey, and I could mm -hmm. hardly read it at the time, but I stole it from a library. <laughs> No, I used to borrow it, and I borrowed it week after week, and then one week I went back for it, and it wasn't there. Mm. And the woman said she's taking it off the shelf, and it was an originally bound one, you know? It was like the old kind of leather bound and all that stuff. And um, she said, no, we're taking it off the shelf. We're going to have a new edition. But I loved that edition. Mm. 
And I saw it on a trolley, literally being sent to be poked or something. So I stole it. <laughs> I stole it. And I took it and I kept it with me for years. And then one day I was talking about it on television. And I said, I've still got it. And the library wrote to me and said, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, bring it back. And they stamped it for me. I've still got it to this day. Um, but that book was about... He wrote that book saying that, look, if black people don't have a better sense of self and knowledge of their own history and a sense of where they want to go, they've taken away the change, but they will control us with their brains. We'll still be in a kind of slavery. We'll, we'll be in economic slavery. And at that time, people, especially women, but also men, black people started lightening their skin and with this kind of bleach stuff that they put on. And Marcus Garvey was completely against that. And that taught me or inspired me to kind of really not be ashamed of being black and understanding that we had a, a very important history that involved inventors and academics and thinkers and scientists and, and all those kind of things that we were told all began in, in Rome or Greece. Mm. Mm. I mean, again, I was found one of the really challenging parts of your discussion about the degree to which racism is sort of sanctioned within the academy mm. now. Um, and I'm not going to try and say that's not true. It's absolutely true. Mm. I suppose if we're leaning towards hope rather than despair, you might say that one of the other things that's happening within academic discourse now is a kind of real digging down and discovery and rediscovery of black histories in the plural um, that go right back beyond Rome. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, in my own period, in the early, in the early modern period, 16th, 17th century. Um, again, do you have thoughts on this particular moment as a, as a kind of bending towards hope? Because part of your discussion, you know, was really painful, that bit where it, Malika was asking you, so is it worse now than it was before? Mm. Um, uh, and, I, you know, I don't want to say we have to be hopeful, but there's, I'm wondering if if you've got a thought about, yeah, where we might go next within the academy, because you're now an academic, you like said it you, or not. You said you don't want to say we, 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 have to, we have to be hopeful. I will always say we have to be hopeful. What our oppressors want us to do is give up. Yeah. They want us to be hopeless, you know. And this is something I've said before, and, and I don't mind repeating it. I have no scientific evidence to back this up. Um, I've read no papers to prove what I'm going to say now. Um, but I just believe in the victory of good over evil. Mm. I believe we must overcome them. Um, and we just have to. If, if we can't struggle on and see victory and just work towards it in whatever field we're doing, whether that is kind of decolonialising the academy or libraries or whatever, mm -hmm. then we might as well just give up. Mm. We might as well just give up. We might as well listen to the racists and, I don't know, I was going to say we'll go back to Africa. I mean, I'll go back to Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, that's what they want us to do. Yeah. You know, the thing with the 70s and 80s, when universities could get away with promoting racist intellectuals, all kinds of things like that, is that there wasn't all these forces I remember kind of reading about Cecil Rhodes and just thinking, why does everybody kind of respect his name so much, you know? And, and it was almost like, shh. and I remember talking to an African person about it and he went, but you know, I've got a Rhodes scholarship, you know, I've got to be grateful, I've got to be grateful. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, no, we can say, you know, there's another way of getting a scholarship if you want to, there's alternatives or we can change it. And I'm just so glad we're having that debate. And it's not just about the debate. I, 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 I feel a bit lazy sometimes. I think it is lazy sometimes when we just talk about the debate. We want action. Yeah. You know, and the, the, the young people who are fired up now want action. That's why they tear statues down. Yeah. You know, yeah. and not only that, uh, I, I, I did a piece the other day for TV where about black people who are putting statues up <laughs> that, that represent us, yeah. all of us, yeah. not just black people, but all of us. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've got hope. 
You know what I mean? I, 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 I really, it may not happen in my lifetime, but there are some great people, much better than me, who have done much greater things than me that didn't see the change in their lifetime, but we still appreciate what they did. Thank you. Malachi, do you want to add anything? What he said. <laughs> <laughs> As so often we say, what he said. <laughs> um, we're now past our six o'clock deadline, and I think it's just about come to the end of the session this evening. Um, there are there are one or two questions, but in a sense they've they've been they've been answered really already in the in the discussion we've had already. Um, I can't thank you enough, both of you, for this amazing, uh, really moving, but also really energizing uh, conversation. Uh, as you said, Benjamin, it starts with a conversation with somebody else. Um, it starts through conversation. Obviously, it's got to turn from conversation into action. And indeed, as Elika knows, one of the uh, frames of this discussion is the art and action um, uh, project. Um, and um, I want to thank Elika and Sandra Meyer and also Ruth Scoby, who's here, for inviting Torch to collaborate as part of this conversation and indeed this action uh, today. I'd also like to thank the Story Museum, where we are. Um, uh, open again now, post-pandemic, uh, uh, or no, well, post-lockdown, um, for hosting us so well today. Um, and to thank all those behind the scenes, uh, both here in the Story Museum and at Torch, who made all this possible. Um, thanks, too, to our viewers and listeners um, from all around the world for your comments and questions. And, in fact, to your loyalty to the project that we're building here in Oxford, um, which is through Torch, through the Humanities Culture Programme, through other parts of the university and indeed through engagement with organisations such as the Story Museum here in the city. So this is our last event of the Big Tent live event series for the time being, but we'll be back uh, returning with uh, what we hope will be an exciting programme um, of activity and uh, seasons of different kinds uh, later in the year. We hope uh, that we can welcome uh, you, the audience, back uh, then, uh, and if possible, as we've had the luxury of doing here today, that we might even have some real live in-person events. Um, for now, from all of us at Torch, uh, we wish you all a relaxing summer break. Um, and most of all, many thanks to the two of you, uh, Malachi and Benjamin, for a really amazing um, and inspiring conversation. Thank you. Thanks for tolerating me. You did well. <laughs> <laughs> and likewise. <laughs> Thanks all. <laughs>